On one of the last evenings in 1978, on December 28th, disaster struck in Portland, Oregon. A plane on a cross-country trip from New York was expected to land in Portland but never arrived. The plane was stuck in the air unable to land, and today we'll discuss why. The story of United Airlines Flight 173 is rather confusing, but it is a story synonymous with pilot fatigue and how the focus on just one aspect of their situation created a far deadlier one that went undiagnosed. United Airlines Flight 173 was a Douglas DC-8 aircraft. It's a plane that's a symbol of a long gun era in aviation. The four-engine narrow-body jetliner first flew in the late 1950s. Following numerous revisions of the original aircraft, the type was still popular well into the 1970s and 80s, and United Airlines was a key operator of the plane. In 1978, Flight 173 was their cross-country service from New York to Portland. On this route, the plane made a stopover in Denver, which went off without issue. The DC-8 took off again on that late December day for the rest of the trip to Portland, the pilots expecting to make an arrival there at around 5.13pm. Flights between the large American cities are obviously popular, especially coast-to-coast -coast services, so the flight was rather busy with 181 passengers occupying the cabin, including six infants. Up on the flight deck were three pilots, usual for the DC-8. In the left seat was 52-year-old Captain Malburn McBroom. He had been with United Airlines for 27 years at that time, having joined the airline in 1951. He also served in World War II. He had held the rank of captain for as long as the DC-8 had been in service. His flight experience amounted to over 27,000 flight hours. First Officer Roderick Beebe, age 45, was sat in the right seat. He had only been recently promoted to First Officer earlier that year, and had only 247 hours as a First Officer in the DC-8. Beebe had only recently turned his sights to commercial aviation just a few years prior to this accident, but he held licenses to fly privately and even held a helicopter license. The third member of the crew was the flight engineer, however the accident report officially counts this member as a second officer. Youngest member of the crew, 41-year-old Forrest Mendenhall, had been with United Airlines for 11 years. With just under 4,000 total flight hours logged, he had spent most of his flying career as a flight engineer on the DC-8. During the stopover in Denver, the flight crew reviewed their fuel status. Managing their fuel quantity, they left Denver with just over 21 tons of fuel loaded in the tanks. It was enough for not only the trip to Portland, but also an extra one hour and five minutes of flying time. This extra fuel came from federal regulations mandating an extra 45 minutes of flying time on top of the expected trip. United Airlines also had a policy of carrying an extra 20 minutes worth of fuel on top of that. It is important that we put a highlight on the plane's fuel quantity, for reasons that will become apparent later. At just after quarter to three in the afternoon, Flight 173 left Denver, continuing its journey to the west coast. It would appear that the flight, even on this accident leg, was uneventful up until the approach. The pilots first made contact with approach controllers in Portland at 5.05. The plane had descended from its cruising altitude down to around 10,000 feet. An approach controller gave the flight crew instructions for a visual approach onto runway 28 at Portland, a pretty much straightened approach from the east. The pilots even radioed to the tower they could see the airport despite being several miles out from it. Visibility that evening was very good, the skies clear of cloud and haze. It was a very standard evening at the airport. The controller was getting ready to hand Flight 173 off to a tower controller for landing instructions. On the flight deck of the DC-8 though, things were not going as expected. The pilots for landing obviously wanted to lower the landing gear. A component that secures the right underside landing gear had broken so that when the landing gear was lowered, instead of gradually lowering into place, it fell and locked into place quickly. And this was noticed by passengers in the cabin as an abnormally loud noise and vibration. 
The pilots also noticed the rapid descent of the landing gear, with them even noticing a yawing effect to the right, perhaps linked to the sudden increase in drag that would have been created following the landing gear's sudden shift. This also created an abnormality in how the status of the landing gear was shown to the pilots. Following the activation of the landing gear lever, the pilots never got the expected illuminating green landing gear lights as a confirmation the gear was down. According to the captain in a post-accident interview as detailed in the accident report, only the nose landing gear illuminated green. The possibility of a landing gear failure could have posed a danger to passenger safety. The captain with this information now at hand takes the opportunity to troubleshoot the problem and does not go in for a landing just yet. The information was relayed back to the controller and Flight 173 was directed south of Portland Airport out over the suburbs. Captain Mulburn McBroom would spend the next hour trying to troubleshoot what was wrong with the landing gear. It would become his top priority. Whilst flying at low altitude over the Portland suburbs, the DC-8 was burning into its reserve fuel, while the safety of a runaway was just a few miles away. The concern of a possible landing gear failure on touchdown prompted the flight crew to take steps in preparing the cabin for an emergency landing. Collapse of landing gear is rare, but it has happened. Usually it is non-fatal, and injuries can still occur. And it's not uncommon in these scenarios that the aircraft themselves are damaged beyond repair. Taking his passenger's safety into consideration, the captain wanted to take as much time as he supposedly needed to prepare for this if it were to happen. Fact is, the landing gear was down. We don't know and will never know what would have happened at Portland Airport if the DC-8 did make it to the airport, if that right side landing gear would have collapsed or not, because what happened instead is far more questionable. The DC-8 had now been in a holding pattern at Portland for 23 minutes. The pilots were running through the necessary emergency checklist actions. Among the steps taken was to observe a visual indication of the landing gear position. The DC-8 has a mechanical visual cue on the wings to tell whether or not the landing gear was in place. On the wings, small nubs rise out from the top of the wing. If the pilots could go back and check, they'd know if the wheels were in place. That is exactly what happened. The flight engineer, Forrest Mendenhall, left the cockpit with a flashlight, proceeded down the cabin, and checked the exterior. It was indicated that the landing gear was indeed lowered. At 5.38, the pilots contacted the United Airlines Maintenance Center in San Francisco to explain their situation. With just over three tons of fuel remaining, they calculated they had a maximum of 20 minutes of flying time left. The pilots were in contact with airline maintenance for around six minutes. There was correspondence with the captain where he clarified he'd be on the ground at Portland at five minutes past six. The captain would soon ask again how much fuel was left on the plane at 5.46. There was now just over two tons of fuel left. It had became rather apparent to the first officer and flight engineer that fuel was beginning to run dangerously low. Time would continue to go by until it was about 5.50. Still south of the airport and flying in a southwesterly direction, the captain asked the flight engineer if they could stay in the air for a further 15 minutes. The reply from the flight engineer was basically no. Instead of making a turn for the airport even at this point, the DC-8 continued in its holding pattern. The captain was apparently still unsure if it was safe to land. The landing gear situation still on his mind, while another unrelated crisis mounted quickly. The plane was running out of fuel. In fact, not just running out, but they only had minutes remaining. The plane was nearly 20 miles south of the airport and had now only begun flying in a northeasterly direction. From their position, they needed to line up for runway 28, adding extra flying time to make it to the runaway. 5.55 p.m. With just 1,300 kilograms of fuel around 3,000 pounds, the flight engineer once again highlighted the remaining fuel. Another turn was made towards a northwesterly heading. 
By 6 p.m., the plotted flight data showed the plane heading towards the airport. At this point though, the captain was not satisfied to make an approach. A conversation between the captain and first officer arose about how much time the flight attendants had to prepare the cabin. Then, at just after 6 in the evening, controllers radioed to the plane asking them to make another left turn. The DC-8 was just south of the airport. The plane once again turned away from its destination. The captain still seemed to not be concerned with the fuel situation as he turned his attention towards, as the accident report highlights, checking the landing gear warning horn and the spoilers and anti-skid. He was concerned about whether or not they'll work properly on landing. 6.06 in the evening, a flight attendant entered the flight deck and announced that the cabin was now ready. The plane was 17 miles south of the airport again. Only now did the captain want to try at landing. The atmosphere would now immediately change as the first officer announced they were about to lose an engine. The far right number four engine was about to flame out. It was clear from the captain's response to the statement that he had seemingly lost situational awareness. He asked why. Despite the fact he was given the information from the flight engineer about the low fuel quantity, the first officer gave him a firm response, simply saying, fuel. Engine number four then flamed out due to fuel exhaustion. The pilots now requested an approach from the controllers in Portland and the plane began turning again to the northeast. The first officer suggested opening the crossfeed valves in the plane's fuel tanks. They do exactly what they sound like they do. They transfer fuel from one tank to another. The captain believed the plane had more fuel than it actually had. Captain Mulburn McBroom once again turned his attention back to the landing gear, asking the flight engineer to reset the circuit breaker relating to the landing gear lights. Minutes later, the flight engineer announced that two more engines have shut down. Engines 1 and 2 on the left side have now been starved of fuel and have flamed out. Engine 3 soon followed, and the DC-8 was without engine power. In this scenario, the plane's battery only kept the essential cockpit instruments active. The cabin lighting had gone out. There was a comment in the cockpit about potentially making it to the smaller airport in Troutdale. However, it became apparent that they could not glide the plane far enough to make it to any airport in the area. Now Captain McBroom had turned his attention outside. He now needed to find a suitable place to put the plane down for a crash landing. They were over the suburbs of East Portland, gliding north. From the view in the cockpit, an area shrouded in darkness appeared in the distance. At nighttime, at a quick glance, this would have appeared to be a field from a distance, only the street and housing lights on the ground giving detail of where the populated areas are. Upon closer evaluation, once the DC-8 got closer to that field, it actually turned out to be a heavily wooded suburban area. Time had now run out. The plane was seconds from crashing. Captain McBroom needed to somehow put the plane down in a populated residential area. He even managed to avoid striking a nearby apartment building and crashed the plane creating a nearly half kilometer trail of devastation demolishing two homes in the process, both of which weren't occupied at the time. When the plane crashed into the ground, there was no fire, perhaps due to the lack of fuel in the plane's tanks. Perhaps incredibly, 179 of the 189 occupants on board the plane either walked away or were rescued following the crash. There were, however, 10 deaths, 8 passengers and 2 members of crew. Flight engineer Forrest Mendenhall was among the dead, as was one of the flight attendants. The investigation put this accident down to pilot error and a loss of situational awareness by the captain, who he himself was held responsible for. Captain Mulburn McBroom soon retired afterwards. Aside from the breaking of that one component in the landing gear, there were no other faults with the plane and the aircraft functioned perfectly. This was an accident that was purely pilot error. The crash of United 173 shares a lot in common with other accidents that occurred over the years. The distraction of potential landing gear problems echoes that of Eastern Airlines Flight 401, another case of a pilot's loss of situational awareness.
It's accidents like United 173 that became case studies in the development of pilot crew resource management, simply known as CRM for short. The culture of the cockpit all across the world was prone to a hierarchical structure of command. These days, pilots work in a horizontal and democratic workplace where all pilots are encouraged to engage with one another and even challenge each other if necessary. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching this video. If you found it to be interesting, be sure to drop a like and subscribe, as there is always a new video every Saturday. This one took me longer than I thought to make and edit, but we got there in the end. A big welcome to all the new subscribers from the last couple of weeks. Seems like a few videos have been doing the rounds on YouTube recently, so welcome everyone. We are closing in on that 100,000 subscriber milestone, quite an insane number that I will need some time to process myself. Anyway, I'm taking a moment here to thank my patrons over on Patreon for their amazing ongoing support. Their names are on the screen right now, so if you see your name here, a massive thanks to you. A couple of shoutouts to give this week. Thank you to Haruka Tanao. I hope I said that correctly. Thank you so much to you. Big thanks also to Alderian, who also pledged this week. He has an Instagram, his name is on the screen if you want to check them out. If you want to support the channel further, you can join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from just £1 per month. All patrons get early access to all new content 48 hours before it goes out publicly on YouTube. The link to that will be in the pinned comment below. Anyway, that is where I'm going to end things for this video. Thank you all so much for watching. My own personal Twitter will be in this video's description if you want to follow me on there. That being said, have a great weekend and I will see you next time. Goodbye.